everybody, welcome to the dungeon cooldown! Ron and I are here to hang out with you guys and talk about episode 20 of the dungeon run that happened this past Wednesday. Um, yep. And uh, if you had any questions in the Patreon, we answer those first, and then we head over to uh, questions in chat. So, um, how is everybody today? I saw Angel was here first, our, our moderator. Thank you so much uh -huh. for being here, Angel. Dungeon Speedrun, Sticky Pants, what's up? Gateway Guy, Antium, Kitty Scritches, Jedi K, Whisper Joe, and Willmeister over on uh, uh, YouTube. Um, we are on both right now, so uh, we are looking at the chat from both. How is everybody? Hi, everybody. How are you, Good Ron? To see you. Uh, I am busy, uh, very busy right now, um, but uh, today is going to be, I'm going to see Quantumania today. Yay! Yeah. I saw it last Thursday. Oh, what'd you think? Do you... Does, like, opinions influence you at all? Uh, I mean, uh, not really. I wouldn't... If I did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask, you know? Okay, I, okay. I still hold my own opinions on things, but I do like to know how people frame them for themselves. For yeah. Sure. Uh, I... I liked it. Um, but I thought it was too broad. I oh, think... Yeah. I think, um, I think... Everybody loved phase four, I believe it was, because that whole dilemma with Thanos was so relatable, you know? Right. Like, you really understand right. where, where he's coming from. Um, but, and I, I At thought- At first glance, for sure. <laughs> sure, yeah, I mean- The whole genocide part was a bit, uh, you know, dis disconnecting, but uh, absolutely can, it's, I love villains that you can relate to. And yeah, I, I just mean, about, in, yeah. in contrast to with, uh, with, quantum mania it's like the introduction right. into the quantum realm and it's just right. so massive and so unlike anything in our reality that mm -hmm. i found it hard to relate to and i didn't really connect emotionally with any of the characters and yeah i feel I've, like other shows that do general. that yeah and I, and I felt like that's sort of general with the movies as of late i, mm. I get that sort of generally yeah and i thought it'd be um, different because they're like this is the first movie in phase six i think and so i thought they're yeah. gonna like be setting up this and they have like a chance to start fresh and well, yeah how was jonathan majors how was jonathan majors performance is that uh Z zod uh, kang. kang kang the conqueror mm -hmm. oh uh, uh kang, oh he's great kang. yeah he's yeah. he's I mean, he's the, he's probably the probably the best part of the movie, other than uh, right. Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, Did you see his? Uh, was it Vogue he was on? His Vogue no. cover. Oh. Is Girl, he? Look those pictures up. What's what's his name again? <laughs> what's his name? Uh, Jonathan Majors. Vogue Jonathan Majors. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, and his little wait. Is this right? No, I'm looking at GQ. Maybe it's GQ. I, I, I said Vogue. Uh, it might have been. But there's also Vogue, but I'm not seeing anything crazy here for, at first His glance. His recent ones. Oh, where were they? Is it the one where he's? Uh, no, this is Ben's Hell. This is the one where he's in like his little cowboy outfit. Uh, he was in. Uh, oh, sorry, Ebony Magazine. It was Ebony Magazine. Apologies. Ah, okay. Let me let me let me let me let me look. Let me look. I'm in, uh... This definitely has to do with Dungeons and Dragons. Whoa! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. <laughs> if you are watching right now uh, and you have not seen Jonathan Majors on the cover of Ebony Magazine, uh, you need to go look. Is he a cowboy? Why does he have so many like Western things happening? I don't know. Maybe he that's was like question. born in the South or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, mm. so yeah, that's our thoughts on, on Ant-Man so far. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had a pretty explosive episode. Um, and let's talk about it. Um, oh, yeah, Whisper that's... Joseph, thank goodness you're on YouTube now. Um, people having issues with Twitch. Yeah, we've been hearing that. So I'm glad to hear yeah. that you're able to see us over on, on YouTube. Hi, Raven Queen. What's up, Morgan? What's up, Renee? Hey, Morgan. Hey, Angel Devilson. Also want to say hello to Gateway Guy, Kitty Scritches, uh, The Dungeon Run, Jedi K. Hello, guys. How uh, have you been, Jessica? How's your life? How are you doing? Good. Working. Working hard. Right. Lots of uh, lots of personal projects I'm working on right now. And a viral video on, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, check it out. The The Call of Duty sketch that we did is uh, almost at 2 million on Facebook and uh, climbing on, on TikTok as well. 
Uh, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. The full video is on YouTube on Reckless Comedy. I am a cozy streamer who is being taught by her girlfriends how to do call outs in Call of Duty. And then I'm gonna be playing Call of Duty for the first time tomorrow on Reckless Comedy on, on, on YouTube Live and Twitch. Uh, so if you wanna see me be absolutely not safe for work at all, uh, nasty, <laughs> um, you know, talking, then uh, yeah. What she's saying is she's cursing and she uses a lot of uh... Uh, Call of Duty bro language. Yeah. Uh, and it's really just, you know, it's like learning a new language. That's what I really loved about it is it felt like you were just learning a new language and we were trying to understand uh, what the language actually means. I, I got to be honest with you. I laughed out loud. Uh, I like, <laughs> literally laughed out loud a few times during that thing. So yeah, well we, we laughed our butts off the whole time making that sketch yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, I'm repping some merch today. DTP, Ooh. you can get yours on our, in our merch store. Um, and uh, we've got some other fun stuff on there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, any questions in the Patreon? I don't uh, in the Patreon? No, we didn't have any questions on our Patreon. Y'all, you're Nobody sleeping on the Patreon. Patreon. Seriously. <laughs> um, okay. But we've got a, plenty of people in here, I think, that uh, probably have some questions for us as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one question in the... Uh, I say question. It was more of a uh, let uh, let us know about. Uh, I guess there was some song issues in the last episode or two, uh, so we will be definitely looking at that. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, we're here to answer questions. And if you don't have any questions, then Jessica and I are just going to talk. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's up to you guys to let us know what you want to talk about. So in the last episode, mm -hmm. we reconciled with the God fight that we just witnessed. Um, yep wherein we learned that Saint's twin was uh, non-consensually sucked into a god. Yep. And... Uh, well, the other way around, right? The god was sucked into her. So oh, sure, yeah. sure, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a possession. Very much yeah. like a possession. Yeah, mm -hmm. And um, as far as we know, at this moment, there's nothing we can do about it. We also had the beginning of the episode where Saint kind of like, as a cleric, lost her faith a bit because the god... Mm -hmm admitted that he was not omnipotent like she thought he was and he did not have the power that she thought he did and then we find the two week old rotting corpse of her mother figure um below the pantry in the in the, in the abandoned orphanage where she grew up in um and then uh, we brought the remains back to the center of town. Val and Coco uh, followed the trail to uh, an underground uh, secret meeting place with some baddies. And, uh, and then we tried to sneak our way back and got into a big old fight. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, summation of what <laughs> happened. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I've been, you know, uh, I think I've talked about this before, but I've been waiting for this section of the campaign for a little while. Um, and uh, actually, with, <laughs> ended up having to run it by myself uh, last episode because of some uh, issues. But uh, um, everything's good. Uh, but it was, a, it was a lot of fun to play with you guys at the table. It felt, uh, it felt really good um, to get to this section that I had been waiting for. Um, so I was very proud of, of the discussions that were had. I was... Uh, you know, it's always good when you're a DM and you kind of forget that you're to the DM because you're just sort of watching back and forth mm -hmm. and what's happening. Um, and that happened a few times last episode. Uh, so that kind of indicated to me that I thought it was a really good episode. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Morgan said in, in chat, does I seem a little sus to anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we yeah. did get some questions. Um, Whisper Joe asked, what is the D&D equivalent of an EpiPen and does Saint carry one? I would oh. say the D&D equivalent of an EpiPen is Revivify or maybe like Lay on Hands or Healing Word or, you know, any Fate kind of, of like, maybe some good berries. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's like, can basically like resuscitate you from your death. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Saint's got lots of that stuff. I don't think she had, I don't think she has Revivify in her pocket, but um, yeah, she's got other stuff. Uh, DMs hinted for this is from Dungeon Speedrun. DMs hinted at maybe some info about the world slash gods coming online in the future. Care to expand on that? Uh, yeah. So, um, I think we are getting to a point now where it's less about the the group surviving and more about the group figuring out what's going on. 
Um, so one of the things that I'm uh, I have been working with is to try to uh, and still working on it because it's a lot of work. We, uh, Jared and I have built quite a expansive, not just pantheon, but political system, races, uh, locations, uh, and we've been working on that for. Uh, almost what eight months now something like that maybe more than that um so uh i am planning to release all that sort of publicly uh at least the information that would be available to anyone who watched the episodes um so the dungeon speed run yes more of that coming um but please uh patience uh, uh it is a lot to handle and then i also have to go through all of it and go okay like what have we actually said what is still secret and all that so um yes that is coming for sure uh, and we're already starting to get really the most information about the go the gods, uh, and I'll put them in quotes uh, now, uh, because we're interacting with them, and mm -hmm. people who have knowledge are now around you, uh, whereas before, um, as you I think can tell watching the episodes, that uh, the knowledge of the of religion is not exactly shared much here, right? Yeah. Civilization as a whole has sort of um, just been left to. Uh, grow as uh, these the animus sort of uh, advanced. Uh, so well, yeah. I think um, kind of on that note, what one thing that I found it really interesting about this last episode was we kind of got a hint at maybe some connections with the Heroes of Bingle story in a very broad as a very broad sense because yeah. uh, Ron introduced into the story ancient elementals, kind of like a mm -hmm. raw elemental power that is right. the ancestor of all greater powers and you know if you watched campaign one which i know most of you did kind of the 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 the, the big um mission of that story one of the great missions was to recover these elemental wardens and mm -hmm. we don't know how this is connected yet but i would like to think in my own head canon that the wardens are also the uh, the progeny of these elementals as well. I love that part of your head canon. I will not say one way or the other because I don't want to spoil what we have uh, planned. Um, but there is definitely, uh, and I'm glad that you feeling you're starting to feel the through lines here because that's definitely part of what we're doing. Uh, Morgan's asking, remind me, was Aitha the only god trapped on Toss the last 300 years, or were all the primogeny? Literally everyone. All, everyone that exists on this particular island has been trapped here for 300 years, as far as anyone is concerned. Um, so, uh, yes, Morgan, is that it is all the primogeny that have been sort of trapped here uh, for so long. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're starting to see, you know, more and more uh, of the primogeny. Um, uh, so, well, that part, Morgan, we haven't discussed. That part isn't actually clear. Uh, Thasha seems to be uh, interactive, but not with the general populace, more with the primogeny than anything else. So uh, I, I guess a great way, since Greek and Roman and Norse mythology is sort of uh, where I get a lot of uh, my basic understanding of how supernatural things work, um, you could probably say that you should look at Thasha as almost like an... Uh, an AO or an IO in in D and D terms, where it's a mother of gods. Uh, so it is a god that produced other gods. And again, like I said in the in the last episode, uh, the primogeny are gods in that they're powerful enough that the average individual would go, "Wow, that's a god." Um, but in the classical definition, they are probably more like, um, uh, I think the word I used was archon. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the ancient raw that we that we discussed in the last episode. Uh, yeah, we've been sort of uh, uh, sitting on that um, because you haven't had anybody who knows about them. And so it's really the primogeny who are the first to really uh, explain that there's something deeper here. Um, and I think that sort of points towards, you know, the Reapers are also dealing with something that's a little deeper. And so, you know, we got the really what you're seeing is the first layer is sort of being revealed underneath where you're pulling up, you know, the, the very if you were to look at the earth, if you were to cut the earth into pieces, the first layer we're peeling off is just the surface grass, right? You've been sort of wading through this tall grass and now you're peeling that up to see what's underneath it. So you're going to see bugs and and rocks and start to understand what these things Giant are. Snakes. But then you'll. Well, and snakes in, for uh, <laughs> purposes of this episode. Uh, but then you'll be pulling more and more of that as, as we as we move forward. 
Uh, Angel Devilson has a question in chat. JLP, how do you think Saint is going to change after learning what she did about Aitha and losing her mother figure? Well, right now, um, I would say Saint feels very broken and very hopeless. Um, because while it's happened over a few episodes, this has really happened over the last 24 hours that we went through the labyrinth and um, Saint was killed and met her god and came back to life and then made a deal with the devil and then um, found out that there's this big red hanging sun over her hometown and it's been invaded by um, other people and she finds out that the entire hometown has been charmed by someone who with bad intentions and has been killing people and then she finds out her sister was non-consensually attached to a god and can't save her and then she finds the body of her mother and uh it, and loses her faith uh, that all that so what all you're saying happened. is that all saint you what you're saying is every inch of saint's reality uh is is new and changed yeah and, and it's I, it's that's it's tough to play because i think if i were in that situation i would just i would i would be broken i would peace mm -hmm. out i mean i even felt that way really like after i found the body i was like i had to take a second um to really find a reason to go on which was mm -hmm. i need to hunt down um balthazar uh mm -hmm. because yeah, if, if this was me, I would I would just I would want to go home and get under the covers and sleep and just disappear from the world because especially because Saint is someone who is not a leader, has never been a leader, doesn't want to be a leader and uh, has always let somebody else take the lead and boss her around and tell her what her value is. This is not the kind of person who would rally. Um, and so I really have to find the reason. Um, otherwise, it's like, why would she? Why would she? Why wouldn't she just go under the covers? And, but I think this is the very basics of good character work, right? Like what you're talking about is uh, a character's entire viewpoint is is been proven to them to be uh, a lie, or uh, their the, the veil of what they believe has been removed. Um, and this is where you really start to find out who people are, right? When things change like that, uh, it changes other people. Uh, and I think that's kind of the interesting aspect here that I, that I really enjoy is now that you're seeing this saint, uh, how are you going to change with it? Or are you right? Stories are about, do mm -hmm. we change a character that changes or they don't? Uh, and that's okay. And that's what I'm really interested in seeing what happens with saint. Yeah, I mean, it could really could go one of, of two ways. Either either mm -hmm. she does bury her head, or or this is the moment where she decides that she's going to be in charge of her own destiny. Um, yeah. Yep. But I think she I think we, we she explained it on in game too, where she felt felt like her god choosing her is the first time she has felt special or wanted, um, and then for that to be dashed. It's like, it's really just kicking someone while they're down. Um, so yeah, I don't well, now know. now I feel bad. Now I feel bad. No, I um, mean, <laughs> don't feel bad. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, I mean, it's all story and there's reason yeah. to it. Uh, and there's also, you know, Saint uh, it, it still doesn't have all of the information, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They're only working on the information that they've been, get, been given. Um, but I really do like that Kitty Scritches uh, points out that, you know, uh, they said, I found it interesting that Ron and Jared in the Hanging Gardens have painted the folks proposing a capitalist representative government as the quote unquote bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of a, a cautionary tale here, right? Uh, gentrification is a huge thing in our own reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't yet uh, put that together, that's kind of one of the themes that I've sort of built into this section of the Hanging Garden is that gentrification um can be good, but in most cases that I have found, uh, it really kind of ruins the uh, the basis of what that place used to be. Um, not to change in general, so it really comes up to like, well, what do people want, and why are they doing it, and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, for me, it's it's um, it, it's really interesting, uh, and you know, I think Morgan points out uh, a good thing here is like um, manipulation at its heart. Uh, and I think that's the danger that we have of any kind of government representatives is that manipulation and corruption uh, are 
easy, right? They they tend to be uh, pervasive in that way. And so that's kind of, I want to tell stories that relate uh, to the real world for me, yeah. you know, I want to, and see how, uh, because we can, for me, it's it's like anything else where it, we're putting it into a place where this is just fantasy, we're making it up, uh, and we each have our own uh, it, people, and I want to see what kind of interesting stories we can get uh, to sort of help us reflect on the realities around us. Yeah, I mean, I do love that about the Hanging Gardens, and I think that was apparent right away when we entered that um, this is a moment for the DMs to to say, this is not going to be, there's good bo- good guys and bad guys. This right. is a gray area, because yes, gentrification is bad. But the motivators behind the, the, the people or the, the companies that are gentrifying are not necessarily evil. Right. They are just trying to do their best, but it's hurting right. other people. And I think that one thing that, um, that Ron has put into this story that I love, and I'm not sure if it's being fully appreciated yet, is that, um, that this this town was set up as a matriarchal society run by women women are in power um and it's kind of like a community run place right and i'm not sure that it's being appreciated that how hurtful that is to women that a man or men would come in and try to change that I mean, they have they have no right to change. Like they might they may not agree with the way things are run, and they may be more archaic to them. But oh, it just cuts so deep to find the woman in charge dead at a man's hands. And um, I don't know if it hasn't been quite addressed from a feminist perspective because that's not really hitting home with people or what, but. That really, I mean, Ron, Ron knew it would really hit deep with me. So, um, that, I, I mean, that was kind of, yep. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, that, that really pisses Saint off, but, um, yep. Saint's not really in the headspace right now. I mean, we saw it a little bit of her, of her, her anger, but, um, if right. I was playing a different character, <laughs> I would be so mad. <laughs> well, I think Saint is mad. She right? is mad. Saints yeah. just handle angry anger in a different way, um, and I and I like seeing that as a character choice. Um, you know, and and I want to be clear here. A lot of this is uh, purposefully sent this way uh, for Jessica and I have discussed uh, her backstory, where she came from, in in great detail. Um, and so a lot of this uh, is new to Jessica because you know I have to keep some things uh, away but it's very deeply um rooted in what i know of jessica and what she's interested in 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 pursuing um and so i just sort of set up a situation i knew that would not only motivate saint but would also probably motivate jessica uh (laughs) and then see how they they uh how they um uh, handle it uh Mm -hmm. together so um Right. And, I, and, you know, Kitty Scritches, I, I don't want there to be any, this is where I'm building the gray area. Um, I have my own personal opinions on certain things, um, but that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm not trying to, like, shove any kind of personal opinion down anyone's throat. I am setting up what is a uh, very deep and dark situation uh, and seeing how our heroes respond and whether they do what we define as heroic acts or not. Um, and I think so far uh, we've seen some... Uh, you know, the group is starting to solidify and starting to understand a little bit about what's going on. And you can already see them starting to work together much better than they ever were before. Uh, and I think that's because they now have a common thread of like, mm-hmm. this is messed up. And yeah. like, we need to like do something about this. Yeah, sure. it is easier, I think, right now in the story because we have something a bit smaller to deal with than yeah. figuring out what's going on with the gods. Um, yeah. You know, kind of like having this Balthazar and... And uh, I forget his the other guy's name offhand. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the which one? H- Hunolt, Hun, Hunold, Hun, Humboldt, Reinholt, Reinholt, mm-hmm. <laughs> Reinholt. Seem a lot more attainable um, mm-hmm. in this kind of like smaller arc that we're we have right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do have a common cause to fight for, as Angel Devilson said. Um, Kitty Scritches says Kitty's... certainly the oh, matriarchy yeah, right. was benevolent. Uh, yeah, yeah. As far as yep. as far as we know, um, as far as I know, uh, yeah, it was like this little peaceful town that their main claim to fame was that they took in orphans. You know, like yep. there wasn't really anything, anything 
malevolent happening. Um, and that's kind of, again, like goes into that theme of like, well, yeah, now we may be able to vote people in in a more democratic way, but also we're introducing, you know, trade for capital and um, instead of just like, you know, bargaining and sharing and, you know, there's like, there's all these evils that come with perhaps maybe a little more um, democracy. Mm. And I think, you know, there's the through line that's really starting to think come to the forefront is corruption, right? That... Um, on their own, on paper, right? Many governmental systems appear to be great. Uh, uh, the utopian version of these systems are great. Um, but then it's in actual practice with human beings that we find the flaws in them. Um, and I think that's kind of the metaphor is what are the flaws here and where can they, you know, what, what should we watch out for? What's the cautionary tale? Uh, and I think that's, um, that's kind of, what's going on and you know kitty scratches thank you I, I thank you for saying that because jared and i've been very hard working very hard on trying to make uh, certain things sort of fall in line with the episodes as they as they go without being overly handed with it and being like hey remember that time we did this thing um because jared and i kind of like that like when you can go back and watch it again or watch the the you know the dungeon rushes again to to, to see those things you can find those uh, through lines uh, through each episode. So thank you for saying that. Appreciate that. I'm glad it started to stick with you too. Um, I, again, I think because we sort of moved into this second act uh, now where it's less about, okay, we're surviving a situation that we had no control over and now moving into, okay, we're starting to learn about the situation uh, because naturally the next step would be now that we've learned the situation. And I think that's going to take a little time for the group, but once you learn the situation, then you can start, okay, now we have control and we can make changes. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm excited to see uh, to sort of progress through uh, that. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. I'm, 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 this is a great story for, uh, a D and D character's hometown. I think. I I appreciate, I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Uh, you know, without you, I wouldn't be able to do any of this, right? Like so many of these things that happen have just been me yes ending uh, things that you told me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think um, I think we're gonna. I, I hope we're gonna see that with the rest of the of the uh, cast as well. Um, you know, I don't know how many of them will go to their hometowns because I don't know what choices you guys will make. Um, but, uh, you know, Jared and I have been saying since the beginning, especially if you go back and watch our Arcane Artistries at the very beginning, that your backstories are what make this make this um, story, right? Uh, we can build lands and islands and throw dice on tables and draw lines around them. Um, but unless we have the backstories that you all created we're just sort of making things up. Uh, and so here it's been very interesting to sort of look at each person's backstory and trying to draw parallels uh, into this uh, into this world. Mm -hmm. um, Lucid Warrior says, I'm interested to see if any god killing weapons will be introduced soon. Mm. I mean, I think it's a little early for the god killing weapons once, you know, uh, since we just sort of we haven't really understood, you know, we keep using the word God for the primogeny, and I really want us to use the word primogeny, uh, and that's mostly because it's a different thing than a God, um, as Saint has learned, right? Like, Aitha is not um, omnipotent, um, and I think that's the interesting part, that we have sort of these preconceived notions of what gods are, um, and I think whether we realize it or not, some of that, uh, some of that comes from... Uh, modern religion, um, where benevolence and omnipresence and all these kind of things sort of uh, naturally uh, descend from our modern religions. But if you go back and like actually read any of the Greek Roman stuff or even the Norse, the gods are just messed up, powerful people, right? Just as messed up as humanity is. Uh, and I think that's the interesting part that's always sort of been has helped me understand the world better uh, as I grew up was that like, oh, we're just hurt people, hurt people. And that's God's, at least as colloquially as we know them, uh, is just that is hurting people because they are also hurt. Uh, and I think I think that's an interesting uh, aspect of, of what we're doing here. Uh, Wellmeister probably has a question more for you, Ron. If Saint were not able mm. to get out of her death saving throws, would Aitha have stepped in to save her? Um. 
I imagine so. Um, mostly right because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, right. It, it wouldn't make, there would be no story reason for me to be like, that doesn't happen other than Ron just not wanting that to happen. So absolutely. Um, but now that we have Aitha sort of in this new, this new form that you've seen, right? Uh, and again, spoilers, guys, if you're watching this, we are spoiling the episode because we're talking about it. Um, but at the end, um, Isoth uh, comes into being, uh, the the serpentile nightmare, or the, uh, the she who slithers, um, has come into existence, uh, and immediately, just in, and in the process of doing that, uh, a current avatar is destroyed. Um, that does not kill the primogeny, clearly, um, but the primogeny is in a new form, and what I love, and what I can't wait to see, is the decisions made when that comes back um because right before that happened you know it was identified that saint uh is the next the next uh avatar uh target for aitha in terms of the genetic line uh and as we know from the conversations uh with aitha and about uh sansa um since saint doesn't have any children um as far as they know <laughs> she is the last one uh, so mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what the choices are of the characters on on that, um, especially considering that they've all uh, they've all sort of you no know, crystal ball sort of identified that like oh well if that doesn't happen then like we die uh, or like the world ends or what so uh, for me it's such a it's so juicy as a DM to, because the decision is entirely made by the party. It's entirely made by the people at the table, um, and we're just sort of saying, "Okay, you made that decision. Here are the next steps of of that kind of concept." And and I'm I'm excited to see see that. Yeah, Kitty, Kitty Scritches says Cristobal died and found his god. Saint died and found her god. Guess Val found his god without dying, thanks to a force card. So maybe Val doesn't mm -hmm. have to die. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone has to die. Uh, it's sort of a. Um, the choices, right? Like, it, it's so interesting for me in the last episode to watch you guys sort of have this conversation that was completely understandable. Like, when you found the matron sort of, you know, rotting not but 20 feet from where you spent your entire, you know, most of your childhood, um, I think that the choice of, like, hey, I don't want her to be here anymore. Like, she deserves to be in a better place was the choice that I would have made. Um and so, you know, despite that there's like the bad guys are right there, though, and we might be get some information. Uh, sure. But m the person that I loved is 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 here and they're desecrated and I don't want that to be anymore. And so especially if you're a god of song and, and healing and I mean, just a freedom, in general. Right. Right. Like, I think that's super important. Right. Because uh, leave her there any any longer and she might become undead and we don't want that to be a thing. At I didn't all, even so. think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like. So when that choice was made, I was like, you know, uh, yeah, uh, this is awesome. Uh, and so the, the conversation of splitting the party was really interesting, as we've had many times. Um, and it was it was cool because you you noticed and hope, hopefully our audience noticed that when uh, when Val and, and Coco go into the next room, they literally need Saint to get through it. <laughs> like I literally built that room so that they had to have Saint to get through it. Um, uh, because of her abilities with air and, and, and that kind of, which she ended up using later uh, to do a different thing. Um, so I, I loved that. For me, that's like, you know, I, I want to scream and yell at it while it's happening because this is the kind of stuff that you really want to have happen as a DM um, is like these choices. Like if you had made the choice differently, uh, there would have been a different set of circumstances that we're under. Um, you know, somebody texted me and was like, hey, we're, you know, were they supposed to go back or like, what is this? You know, and, and I was like, there's no supposed to. <laughs> there's only what you, I, I can imagine you may do. Uh, and then sort of setting it up in a reality of, again, consequences, right? Choice and consequence. Um, because D&D &D is sort of built that way. Choice and consequence. Yeah. Yeah, well, Carrie and I had talked about um, splitting the party the previous episode because mm -hmm. she was saying that... Um, she was like, Coco really didn't want to go with the party through the teleportation circle. She wanted to rest first. And, mm -hmm. uh, but she was like, I felt like I, I, you know, I didn't want to split the party because I thought you weren't supposed to do that. And I was like, 
Well, I, just so you know, you, you can split the party. Um, right. You, it's not the best in most situations because that usually the DM has a monster or a baddie that their challenge rating is is set for the whole party. A party, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so in that case, you know, you're really leave, you know, letting people um, get hurt, but um, it's not a bad thing plot wise as long as you're not doing right. it all the time because. For an audience and for the people at the table, if you're like constantly flipping back and forth um, a lot, that cannot be the most entertaining thing. But I remember in campaign one, we would split the party pretty frequently and, and we would go, mm -hmm. we would like have one scene happening and it was dramatic. And we had another scene happening that was comedic. And we as a team would jump back and forth between those two scenes. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting. And so yeah, it gives us a lot of play with with improv, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so like sometimes when when it makes sense in the story to split the party, especially if you could do it with multiple people on each side, um, it right. can lead to really interesting storytelling. And I think when we split the party in this episode, it was a cool way to progress, um, progress two things at the same time and almost like expedite what we were doing. We had, yeah. we did have to double back because um, we needed the whole party to actually do the confrontation. But as far yeah. as exploration, um, I don't think that we, I, I think that uh, it didn't slow down that at all. We just, we kind of took care of the, the business that we need to take care of with the body. We figured out where the thing was that we needed to find, and then we, then we did it. Yeah, I think I think you hit a nail on the head there, Jessica. Where it's like, when it makes sense, yeah, do it. it you know, naturally we say don't, and and our audience says don't because just the the, the mechanics of D and D indicate that if you get into trouble uh, without your party, that's not that great. Um, but I, I think here it was really good, and and I hope people recognize that I sort of was rewarding the players for actually doing that split um, because they got information in different ways about what was going on, and I don't know that they would have gotten that information if they hadn't split and so for mm -hmm. me it's 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 interesting to see um uh to see where you guys uh definitely go with that yeah, yeah. uh morgan said saints win while stopping balthazar from leaving could be a lifesaver next episode yeah i was so happy because mm. i i i thought about doing win wall because ron had given me kind of like a hint that that would um wind help would lot. actually help mm -hmm. get rid of that pollen that was being mm -hmm. released um uh, and every round I was like, is this the time? Is this the time? But it was my last third level spell slot. So I couldn't, I couldn't just do it anytime. I really had to wait when it would, uh, what's the word? I, I had to, I had to be, strategic be strategic with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think your choice was, uh, I think Morgan has a really good point here where it's like your wind wall using and stopping Balthazar is probably a, a, a very good choice. Yeah, well, and I, I'm, I, I got kind of lucky because I had no way of knowing that he was going to turn into that gas. Like yeah, that happened exactly. three rounds in, and um, if I had cast Windwall before, it certainly would not have been to close the door. It would have been yeah. to cut through some of the enemies and get that pollen flying around. I would not have sealed the door. I wouldn't have any reason to do that. So yeah, um, yeah, I think I just got kind of lucky because sometimes when you wait. I'm I'm the kind of player for sure. I don't sit on my spells. I like I just I I do the big thing right away because yep. I, I I I would rather use the big things, saving one spell slot that I really need, but using most of the big things and then like having smaller things later on. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I just uh, it because it it could have happened where I uh, um, yeah did I didn't work out right. I did. Yeah, so, but uh, and, we'll uh, you know, there's a little bit of in the in the in the pre preparation of this uh, that is kind of what um, um, uh, what Jeff has taught, and Jeff and I have talked about in the previous season, especially during cooldowns, which is like you you trust your uh, you trust your instinct, um, and hope that your subconscious sort of throws you in the right direction as you're doing things, especially if you're thinking things through and sort of, and trying to go uh, um, uh, line by line and, and really putting in that mind palace work of, okay, here's what this would do mm -hmm. and here's what this, because we got to, like, I'm, I might have, have an idea and a set of uh, of things that I wrote down that I like, okay, maybe 
the you know Satan might do these things if this happens and and that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you just sort of have to trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a little bit of that here where um, my subconscious sort of led me in the right directions, specifically with the gaseous form uh, um, potion uh, and and uh, all the pollen and all that kind of stuff. It's just sort of really. If you trust your instincts, um, and, and you learn this in doing in, in doing improv, so I can I can definitely say if you have not taken improv class, you should. It will very much help you in your entire life, yeah. not just in performance. And everybody um, should take one. Yes, it, it really helps you understand, and and the paradigms that are involved in improv really help you understand that um, you should trust your brain more, and that failure is not really bad. It can be a very good thing, and you can learn from it, uh, and well, that's kind of it. What I love, just like the sidebar about the taking improv classes as anyone, if you are with us right now in chat and you identify as somebody who is socially awkward or you get social anxiety, uh, anything kind of like in that realm, taking an improv class, you learn to yes and somebody. And you know, we on the Dungeon Run talk about it all the time that if, if you strive to make someone else look good, you'll look good. Mm -hmm. um, or you'll have a better time at least. And right. I mean, so many times in real life when someone like has a comment or makes a joke, if you know how to be like, yes, and then this thing happened too, and you like try to set them up to make them look good, you will look like you are socially adept. You will look right. like you are funny, sociable, right. extroverted. Um, yeah. And the more you practice that, the better it will be. So if you have any, any nervousness around that, definitely go take an improv class. They're in every city. And I, I, I really think that even our political situation, speaking of governments, uh, could really f benefit from this kind of stuff too, right? Like the whole idea is like, we are different people, but we can still find common ground. And when we find common ground and we're all actively looking for com cl uh, common ground, then everyone benefits. And it's again, that concept of uh, a rising tide raises all ships. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... You know, I found a lot of that recently in you guys, uh, yes, ending each other and really and really supporting decisions that are made. Uh, and I think we're seeing, uh, you know, Kitty Scritch has mentioned that season two seems to be really clicking. And I think that has everything to do with it. I think it has everything to do with, hey, let's let's these are hard decisions. Right. And and I, I want to be very honest about Ugo. Ugo, I made decisions that were that could have been appeared to be um, uh, conflicting Uh only so that we could find a resolution mm -hmm. to that conflict. Oh yeah, yeah, you definitely right. That. And that and 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 so my whole point, even when I was being uh, conflicting, was I'm attempting to make the person opposite from me look freaking brilliant when they solve the conflict. Yeah. Um. And I think, I think in general, if we work like that with our work, you know, anyone you work with, uh people you have any sort of relationship from, you know, just meeting them to, uh, uh, you know, a lover. I think if you really trust that everyone involved can take that mindset, man, so much is possible. You know what I'm also thinking about, which is what, that's interesting about campaign versus campaign, campaign one versus two right now is that, um, I think, I don't know what it is, maybe because in campaign two, we were thrown into a survival situation mm -hmm. and we we're all very afraid from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that campaign one cast were the kind of players that would use the big thing first, you know, mm -hmm. go for the big spell, go for the big hit, run into yeah. the battle. Um, and I think in, because we maybe were in a survival situation, we we're scared not everybody is going for the big thing. Um, even me, like I, like I said, I usually do, but even with Saint, like I was waiting, I was like saving things because I was like scared and I wasn't sure what I would need. Um, I think that that uh, makes us less effective. And so now mm. maybe I would guess that maybe part of our cohesiveness, cohesiveness that's happening now is because we're less afraid and we can make those yeah. big moves. And, Absolutely. Um, and I would, I would just encourage us to do even more of that. I, I 100% back that 100%. <laughs> uh, Evan Old School says, uh, thank you. First time chat, Evan Old School. Ogo was a very difficult character to play. I yes. Uh, playing dumb when you're not is taxing at the least. Uh, you know, for me, it was not playing dumb when you're not is taxing. Guys, I'm dumb. Let's just be honest. I'm a dummy. Um, Are you saying you're uh, dumb, Ron? Oh, yeah, for sure. No, you're I not. Very dumb. No, you're not. 
I, it, you're so smart. Shut up. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate the compliment. I do have some don't good listen ideas. To him. I'm going to mute but you. The more and more I learn, the I'm more and more of how much I don't know. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what I mean is um, uh, I have a little bit of a, of a uh, curmudgeon view of that. Um, I still make mistakes, guys. I still don't get things right. I still miss the target. And that's what I mean is I'm, I'm flawed is probably a better way to say it than I'm dumb. Uh, I'm flawed. Uh, and I recognize that flaw because I think that's the way for me, that's the way to make sure that I continue to focus on getting better is that I am flawed. If I ever think that I'm smart or if I ever allow myself to think like I did it, I won't grow anymore. And I don't want that to happen. I, I think that's true. You can, but I think you can be smart and also say that you don't know everything. I, I think I was actually yeah. just having this conversation the other day that as soon as you start to solidify your opinions on things, as soon as you go, yeah, I know about this thing. I've made yeah. I've made up my mind about this thing. You become a lot less able to empathize with things. Yep. And I mean, you see it all the time when with people who you may have friction with that it's probably because they're very set in their ways or they they're not open mm -hmm. to hearing your point of view. And I mean, we even see that like, you know, at the world at large with our political leaders, um, the more open you are to fear. listening. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really just fear. It's all based in fear, right? Yeah, you're afraid to fail. Yeah. You're afraid to feel mm -hmm. bad. I mean, I definitely mm -hmm. attribute some of the most um, important moments of my growth were in moments where I felt like crap about myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. a friend called me out on something or I realized something that I had done and I felt really bad, but as, as long as you can look at that moment and go, this isn't the end. This isn't like, this isn't me now. This moment doesn't define me. If you can always realize that there's mo there's, there's growth, that you're gonna meet new people, you're gonna have new chapters. You can pivot from that moment into something else, then that's the important part. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a good metaphor for what we're seeing uh, with Saint right now too. So uh, I'm interested to see uh, where where the the party goes with this um you, you are in a very dangerous situation right now um and i think morgan sort of identified earlier with kitty scratches and the cons and the talk of death um you know i i say it a lot but one of my favorite quotes is from uh from hook and it's it's all about that death is just the next adventure right mm -hmm. death is just the next adventure um but it's again we're afraid of it generally speaking um because it's an unknown it's a it's a journey into not knowing where you're going um and we all i think can relate to if we don't know where we're going we all are a little afraid uh and that feels like reality most of the time uh, i do want to say thank you everyone for telling me i'm not a dummy i, I forget <laughs> sometimes i forget sometimes that we're in a modern setting and that uh it used to be like i'm a dummy is sort of a a, a, a jovial way of saying that i recognize that i have skills and talents um, but I don't want to be egotistical about them. Uh, and that's, I should probably should just say that, right? I should probably just say that. Thank you. I, I do consider myself a smart person. Um, I wouldn't DM, uh, if I, especially for a show like this, if I didn't think I could handle that kind of situation. So, um, uh, I, I appreciate the compliments. Uh, I love what, how FF Gogo stated it. Being smart and being the smartest aren't the same. Acknowledge where you stand, but keep the long road ahead in view. Yeah. And also, thank you so much, FF Gogo, for your timestamps that you leave us on our videos. Uh, yes, those are, thank you. Those are so helpful and make the viewing experience better for everybody. So you are very much appreciated. Is that on YouTube? Yes, it's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I, I should probably open up the YouTube so I can see that, those comments, too. Uh, yeah, look not, at me. I'm Learning not, new things. I'm not sure we've added it to the most recent uh, video, uh, those mm. timestamps. Um, but yeah. uh, what, what FF GoGo does, if you don't know, is is they go in and they they create chapters from the episode as they watch. And uh, that breaks up the video into these like uh, viewable chapters and uh and chunks yeah. yeah yeah i'm actually gonna do it right now i'm gonna i'm gonna add those chapters to our most recent <laughs> video thank you ff yeah cella cellophane uh, 1744 another uh, first time chatter welcome um says you sound a lot like neil degrasse tyson so i don't think you sound dumb <laughs> well it might be because uh you know i grew up really loving um um neil degrasse tyson and uh, uh carl sagan um they really you know for me i've said this before understanding the world around me in the best ways that we can uh, via you know trial and error and the scientific process helps me sort of um calm and understand what emotions are and how and how to deal with them um 
Uh, and those individuals, I think, have very good viewpoints on uh, not just like how to understand the physical world, but also how to approach it. Um, Carl Sagan had a lot to say about, um, you know, what, what it means to be uh, to to be in love and, and, and all these kind of things. And they come from just practical standpoints. You want to see what they talk about in terms of like what we should be doing with our government. Uh, it's usually very practical. And so I have an opinion, speaking of government, one of the opinions I have is that we should have more scientists in politics. Oh, yeah. Um, but the hard part of that is, is by general nature of the scientific process, does not necessarily mesh well with politics, at least the way that we have uh, colloquially defined it. Um, but for me, that's like... I've been thinking about this a lot lately is, is, well, how do I, like, should I get into politics? And if I did, like, what do I need to do in order to sort of uh, protect myself from the pervasive things that happen when you move into po politics? Um, but, you know, it's, it's so, it's so strange, uh, the, the current situations and, and things that we live in. And it's, uh, you know, I, I, just to point out, like, what not even five years ago well maybe because we've been on the show for four so probably more like seven or eight years ago i never would have said uh you know one of the most popular uh, ips in this world would be a D, &D based ip <laughs> never would have said that you know and that for me just shows you like y what you know changes all the time and what's real and what's true changes all the time and so if you're focusing again on well, I'm just here to try to make the people that are my friends and loved ones look brilliant in the world. Uh, I think that, again, is such a strong, a strong uh, philosoph uh, philosophy. Philosophy? It's such a strong philosophy, philosophy guys. Well, speaking of making uh, people look good, I'm looking through these chapter titles that FF Gogo le left for us. We have mm. Power Reveal, Upstairs Appraisals, mm. Dishearted Orphanage, Hazy Haze, Guidance Wanted Into the Sewers, this is like, these are the best chapter names. You are so uh, good at this. Uh, yeah. Very, Go -Go very should impressed. definitely write our chapter titles. <laughs> very impressed. Yeah. Um, well, that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you yeah. for showing up for us. Uh, we have kind of a crazy cool down schedule, but um, we're going to have some uh, changes in the show schedule coming up soon. So we're going to let you all know about that. Um, and that will probably affect cooldowns as well, but we're going to keep bringing you guys content, new content, yes. and um, Marvel has not given me the go-ahead yet to um, say anything. I'm still contractually obligated to silence, so as soon as uh, uh, we get the go-ahead, we will, probably this Wednesday, right? We're going to be yeah. Um, yeah, I think announcing so. some, lots some of really, things. Yeah, lots of really exciting stuff down the road for us, um, and I'm I'm excited to see... Uh, what we do in the next year or two because man there there's a lot of opportunity here and i can't wait <laughs> um so yeah we're gonna be back live for episode 21 on wednesday at 6 p.m pacific uh 9 p.m eastern and uh yeah if you haven't seen the show live hang out with us we're on twitch and youtube you can interact with the show um and we are supported by patreon as well as the interactivity for the show um, and if you like the show, please leave us a comment, like the video, and if you are a Patreon subscriber, you will get this video right away in Patreon and everybody else. It will be released on YouTube a couple weeks in the future. We, we like to give that as one of our Patreon perks, the, some of the, the VODs. Um, and, yeah, uh, ooh, a tease says Jedi. Yes, it is. Yes, it's a tease. Uh, and I want to thank everybody um, for showing up for contributing, for being part of our Patreon. Again, I say this every time, and, and I will not stop saying it. Uh, none of this is possible without people like you. Uh, so thank you so much for being supportive and for helping us out. Uh, and also, hey, do me a favor. Go and follow Jessica on her personal account stuff. Go yeah. and follow me on my personal accounts and stuff. And, and uh, you know, we we love interaction. We love uh, we love to 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 build an audience and to and to and to see viewpoints uh, and to have a conversation because that's what modern social media is so uh, do that for us and i would very much appreciate it and uh, if you're still with us on twitch stick around for a raid uh, we're gonna go raid captain robert um and we will see you on wednesday oh, nice bye bye everyone